I'm Dr. Ernest Jackson, and I'm honored to share with you the living Word of God. Continuing subject matter from last week and several weeks gone by, we're talking about walking in the state of being blessed, or blessed state of being. We want to share also, in continuing, to talk about being aware, taking heed, I remember at the end of the last message, we talked about taking heed of things that you hear. Jesus said, Be, you have heard that it hath been said of old times. And then you go, ye, you heard that it hath been said. You heard that it hath been said. So this week, we wanted to branch off a little bit and work with some of the things that you have heard that have been said that may not be completely true. And the reason why we're doing this is because to walk in a blessed state of being, we must know what the scriptures said. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Which to me means, he was telling the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life the way you see it. But they are they which testify of me. So in that, we would have to search the scriptures to find out about Christ what the scriptures really meant. But we haven't done that just like the scribes and the Pharisees of yesteryear hadn't done either. We really don't know that there's laws of the scripture. For an example, you can do research in Deuteronomy 19 and 15. That's Deuteronomy 19 and 15 and Matthews 18 and 16. Matthews 18 and 16 and Deuteronomy 19 and 15. And both of these scriptures are saying one in the New, one in the Old Testament, which is saying, you know, let everything be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses, or the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter is established. So that is a law that is used in understanding the scriptures. You must have at least two scriptures that say in the same thing not you paraphrasing or putting pieces together, but saying the same thing on its own for that truth to be established. It's true in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament, only we don't know it. One of the things that has been said, you know, has been said, I've heard, I've been around 55 years, been, not only been in churches, God saved me off the streets in 1967, January. So this is my 55th year of walking with him. He changed me from being a street thug. And here I am walking with the Lord 55 years later. Now, you know I'm saying that? I've been around a while. Uh, and people are saying things in churches and they, it's been watered down. The reality of God or the charge of God to live clean has been watered down so much that there are things that have been said in the church. For an example, you have heard that it has been said that, you know, God understands that we're just human. He knows that we're frail. He knows that we're made carnal. He understands that. And here's the biggest part of that. When people go, you know, the Lord don't expect us to walk perfect. He don't expect that of us. And he go, well, you know, we all make mistakes. You ever hear that one? We all have faults. We all have failures. We all make mistakes. And God understands that. Right? But that's, that's what you heard. Right? What if it's not true scripturally? What if, in our ignorance, the fact that we're not informed and we've been taught wrong, we believe that God understands these pitfalls and these downfalls and us missing Him and falling out with Him time and time again, and He understands that. But what if He doesn't? I got bad news. He doesn't. And it's not acceptable. What if there were men that walked before God on the earth and didn't have all those faults and failures and, you know, mistakes and accidents like we claim. But without the Spirit of God living in them, walked wholesomely before the Lord many days, if not all the days of their life. And the Scripture to prove it, and God verifies that. Let's go to 2 Samuel 11 and 4. Herein we have the scripture with David, who God had made king over Israel. And David was out on, you know, you go into the first verse of that 
11 chapter, and you find out that he was on his rooftop and he saw this woman bathing. He inquired as to who she was. Uriah's wife, this, that, and the other. Okay, so now we find in the fourth verse how David sent messages and took her. 2 Samuel 11 and 4. He sent messengers and took her, and she came in under, and he lay with her. Okay? For she was purified from her uncleanness. I uh, hope you know what that means. And she returned to her house. Hmm. So let's look down at the 15th verse. See what's going on down there, because some other things took place. And he wrote a letter. He tried to cover it up. He found out she was pregnant. He tried to cover it up by writing a letter to the generals up front and having them put Uriah on the front lines, and he got killed. Okay, we understand that. Now, we got another problem. And the problem is, you get down to the last verse, or the 27th verse, I don't know if it's the last night. Yeah, the 27th verse of this same chapter, and the problem is this. And when the morning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house. After he was dead, she, he took her to marry her as his wife. And she became his wife in this 27th verse and bare him a son. But that thing which David had done displeased the Lord. God was upset with him because God was watching what David did. He said, well, you saying you're false. Yeah, I am. I want you to see this. Okay, let's go to, let me see, yeah, the 12th chapter and the 9th verse, 12 and 9 of 2 Samuel. And so God sent Nathan to David to talk to him about this, and God said to, had him say to him, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. God was not happy with that. Watch, go down to the 14th verse, show you something. Go down to the 14th verse. How be it because this deed thou hast given occasion by this deed. But we don't realize when we're doing things we ain't got no business doing, we give the enemy an occasion to come in. Look what, what God had the, the prophet say to him. How be it because of by this deed thou hast given occasion to the enemies of the Lord. You allow the enemies of the Lord to come in. And he began to swear that, you know what, uh, you blaspheme. The child is born unto thee shall surely die. God said, you know what, I'm going to kill your child. So it ain't going to leave your house either, by the way. Somebody said, well, yeah, he messed up royal and God got him. Yeah, but herein lies something else that we don't look at. So he said, well, that proves we all have faults and failures and shortcomings. Really? It proves we all make mistakes. We all have accidents. You know, certain things you can't control, they happen and you just have to you know, go with it. No, watch this. 1 Kings 14 and 7. 1 Kings 14 and 7. And so it says here, God is bringing another man into the house of David to rule as king. And God said, Go and tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, for as much as I have exalted thee from among the people and have made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom from the house of David, watch this, and gave it to thee, because God told him he's going to do it, and watch. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, even though I gave you the king, you ain't haven't been as my servant David. Watch this, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only, which was right in my sight. Look at this, right in my eyes. Did that only. But did he mess up? But God said he did that only. Watch. There's another scripture. Let's see what we got here. Let's go. 2 Kings 
No, first, yeah, first Kings 15, let's go to the next chapter. 15 and go to the fourth verse. So, coming into the kingdom, and God had this saying here in the fourth verse of the 15th chapter, Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Watch this next verse. Because David, watch this, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from any of the things which the Lord commanded him all the days of his life, save only the matter with Uriah, the Hittite. Well, so this young man followed God completely. All the days of his life, he didn't do anything wrong other than the thing with Uriah's wife. And God testified of it. So where's all these mistakes? And God understands our heart and understands our flesh and understands that we're just human. Here is a man that walked before God and he did one thing wrong before God his whole life. Are you hearing that? These things shock me to understand where the church has fallen. What we've allowed to creep in and to believe that we, we all make mistakes, we all have accidents. Don't you know that's carnal thinking, stuff, stuff that comes up out of men and women that have failed God? Because you cannot allow and accept that. That's not acceptable. Here is the king of Israel. Showed you how he messed up. God was displeased. God was angry. But then God turned around. And even after he was gone, God testified of this man's life. Said, you know what? Jeroboam, you wouldn't even have this position, but I'm giving it to you because of David. Yeah, David messed up, but he followed me and did what I asked him to do only. Then he turns in another chapter and says, you know what? David did what I asked him and walked with me, with, before me with all his heart, except that one thing, what he did with Uriah. So my question to the church that was, ooh, that was under the law. Do you think anything less than that is accepted in Christ? How dare us teach that he understands your youth. He understands you, you know, you're female or you're male and how times are. You think that's acceptable with God? No. No, it's not. And I'll even show you. Go down to the ninth verse of this same chapter. Ninth verse. And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And forty and one years he reigned in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was, whatever that is, Machachah, and daughter of Issaphlon. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord as David did his father. Now, his father was in David. But God called him his father because of the lifestyle. He lived just like David did. Now watch this. Go down to the verses. And it says, oops, 12th verse. <laughs> and he took away the Sodomites out of the land. He put the Sodomites out of the land completely. Look, LGBT community, I have no offense with you, but what accepted in God's word. It's not accepted. What is accepted in life sometimes is not accepted in God's word. God's word is true. So he put the sodomites out. If you look up sodomites, it talks about male prostitutes. So God had them, have him put them out of the land. Out of the land and remove all the idols that was there. Now watch this. Go down. And 14 verse. And it says, Latter part, nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. He walked like David did. David did what he did, and God was upset with him. That one thing, God testifies that 
that one thing. Other than that, he walked behind me in everything that I wanted him to do. Can't you and I do it? Then here come Asa. And he did just like David did. And the scripture says his heart was perfect with God all his days. Why am I saying this? Because you've heard that it's been said that it's okay and God understands. Somebody's not telling the truth. And they're not standing in God's stead or speaking for God. Well, they're trying to, but they shouldn't. Because that stuff is not accepted with God. It's not accepted by the book, by the word. I found out something that we didn't look at. You know, the word of God is not something that is apart from God, although it's in a book form. He inspired this to be said to us. So the other part is like him showing up on the mountain saying it himself. This is his word. Somebody says, well, I don't believe it. Okay. <laughs> Your choice. My point is this. There's a lot of things being said. Are we examining, like I said on last week, are we checking these things out? Are we, we holding them in mind? Are we thinking about these things? Are we pondering them at all? Many of us, once we leave church, we go back to our lives and do what we do and do it well. Doesn't matter what it is, you know. But we're, this is not enabling us to know our God better. My point to you is, let's get in this thing with our whole hearts and know what it is. Now, what if there's some things, and I know there are, many things that God wants us to know that we don't know and we're going to be held accountable for because we didn't even take the time to search it out or to know it. And that's what we're doing. Again, we're expecting God to give us everything and we give him nothing. Jesus died for us. He gave his life before many of us, I mean, were even in existence. He gave his life. Now we have another problem. Because we won't acknowledge him, he won't acknowledge us. But I was at the store the other day, and I stopped by the, a place this morning to get a sandwich, and standing there, and, you know, people in line, and guy would, he saw my shirt on, I had a military shirt on. We talked about, you know, being in the military. So a guy said to me, he said, you know, God's been good. I said, yeah. He says, he says, it's important to be blessed. I said, yeah. I said, but it's more important to be obedient. See, we figure the most important things is to be blessed of God. Uh, but you know what's more important than being blessed of God? Of being obedient to him. Because if we're obedient to him, then we can assure ourselves of being blessed by him. We have declared for God knows how long, we're blessed and highly favored. But have we been obedient to be blessed and highly favored? They're connected. Now, and the guy said to me, he said, you know, he said, I've got a question for you. Because I got my, uh, on the front of my car, the, uh, a license plate with this emblem on it. So the guy said to me, he said, I gotta ask you a question. I said, yeah. He says, uh, you pay tithes? I said, yeah. He says, uh, I don't know. Don't look like we have to pay tithes anymore. I'm like, oh boy. I had a couple folks call me and I said, have some other folks stop me and ask me questions about that. Now, I talked with a great friend of mine, known him for 50 years in Connecticut. And I said, you know, I don't like to address things in, in such seemingly a timely manner to be attacking people because I don't have time for that. And I'm not doing what I'm getting ready to do now. I'm not doing it in defense of the church as far as finance is concerned. Anybody that knows Dr. Jackson, I don't ask for money at all. Folks that bring tithes to this ministry or pay tithes, because the scripture said you should pay tithes. Those that pay tithes to this ministry, they do it between them and God. And now we're going to find out there's some other things that we may or may not need to do. So, uh, being around 55 years, there seems like every 10 to 15 years or so, a group comes up or a person comes up uh, and begin to teach that tithing is not scriptural. Not scriptural in the New Testament. And so it's brought to my attention that someone recently said that. Now, as uh, far as 
he, she, or their concern, I'm not concerned about that. But my concern, like I told my friend in Connecticut, there are people in the body of Christ that are connected to God with their tithes and offerings, and that's their only connect. If they're convinced to not bring tithes, what connect will they have for as being blessed? Some people, that's all they got. Because they bring the tithes, or you give the tithes, or pay the tithes, however you want to word it. They're connected, they have a connection with God, and He blesses them through that. If they stop, they have none, because folks don't pray like they give you the impression that they do. My defense, or my position of defense, or of aggression, is for them. People can believe what they choose, but what we teach must be established by two or three witnesses and proven. Most folks don't know that when you believe that tithes is not New Testament, don't know that it's taught in the New Testament. They didn't look. Oh, it's taught in the New Testament in several places. Only they didn't look. But let me ask a question. Uh, we're no, I'm no longer under the law. I agree. Let me do this. We're under grace. Right. So, now, they say, well, tithing is an Old Testament teaching, and it's not taught in the New Testament. Now, what if, what if, what if there's two different teachings on tithes? What if there's tithes for two different dispensations that he, she, they, or we didn't know about? And what if it's scriptural? <clears throat> it is. Herein lies the problem. People haven't done research. People that are out there teaching that and believing that haven't done their research. Now you've got innocent people that all they've been doing is giving their tithes. That's their connection to the Lord. Watch what I'm going to say. Please, ma'am, please, sir, till you search out things and find out the whole truth of the matter, please, sir, please, ma'am, be quiet. Keep your mouth shut because now you're confusing people and in your ignorance you're letting the enemy use you. Hope that's not too strong. If it is, you'll get over it. Here's the point. We have two dispensations, the law and grace and truth. And we think that tithing was only by the law, and it wasn't. Only we didn't know it. Only we didn't search it out. So we go off misguided because we didn't do research, and we misguide others and we become a tool in the hands of the enemy. I could simply do this. Watch, let's do this. I could simply go, I could simply say that Christ, uh, well, let me do it this way. Let me, let me get my scripture up first, and you're going to like this. It's going to be cute. Let me get my scripture up here. Okay, all right. Always believe the word. Always do research with the word. Paul said, though we, or an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be accursed. So um, he's saying, I'm an apostle of God. The, if we, the apostles, teach you, and even an angel from heaven come down and teach you something other than what's in the book, let him be accursed. Okay? So now then I would ask the question. Uh, let me use myself. I'm Dr. Ernest Jackson, pleased to meet you. So, are you going to believe God's word or believe me? Are you going to believe what Jesus verified or are you going to believe me? Somebody said, oh, come on, brother, we're going to believe what Jesus verified and what the word verified. Great, what? Jesus taught on tithes and folks didn't even know it. <laughs> Just whoosh, zoom right over. Watch. Matthews, the 23rd chapter. 
and the 23rd verse. In his confrontation with the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus said this, Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithes, did you see that? Ye pay tithes of men and of anise and of cunning and have, you pay in tithes. And you have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The, you're giving your tithes, that's good. But you have, look, you are not paying attention to the weightier matters of the law. You're leaving that off. Do you see that? Judgment, mercy, and faith. You're leaving the weightier things off. Watch what he said. These things ought ye to have done. And what? Not leave the other undone. He's talking about tithes and showing love, the weightier matters of the law, and giving tithes. You ought to do, look. You say it's said clear. These ought ye to have done. What? Handle the weightier things or tithes. Either one. Let's say the weightier matters. Okay? You should these are the things you should have done. And look, and not leave the other undone. That means you should do that too. So he's saying the things you haven't done, you should do that. But the other things you don't leave undone. That means bring your tithes. Boom. Jesus. <laughs> oh my God. How about that? We didn't see that one. <laughs> and then when you look in Luke, the 11th chapter and the 42nd verse, it says the same thing. You ought to have done those things and not leave the other undone. So not leaving the other undone, do these. He's only talked about two groups of stuff. Do these and not leave the other undone. You're still supposed to do that. Why would Jesus tell them to pay tithes in the New Testament if it wasn't for New Testament? I could just leave it right there. But no, no, no. We're not going to stop there. Let's do this. Does anyone know who Melchizedek is? Yes, Melchizedek is the king priest of Salem. Uh, he is the guy in the 14th chapter of Genesis about the 18th through the 20th verse that met, people go, met Abraham when he was coming back from the slaughter of the king. Well, well, not quite, because if you go back and look at that, you'll find that Abraham, Abram's name wasn't changed to Abraham yet. <laughs> it was still Abram. God didn't change his name to Abraham yet. So when you go back and read it in the, uh, yeah, over there in Genesis 14, I believe in uh, 18 and 20, it's going to say Abram. So he, he's out there and he blessed him. He came back from the slaughter and uh, Melchizedek come out with the bread and wine and give it to them and and you know, he blessed them. They gave him they gave him tithes. They gave him tithes. Now if they gave him a tenth and gave him tithes, he blessed them. Oh, by the way, he was not only the king priest of Salem, he was the high priest of the most high God. Wait. He was the high priest of the most high God and let's see, Abram or Abraham, Isaac. Jacob, Levi, that was four generations before the Levites even existed. So, tithes to the Most High God had already been established before the law. Ooh, God. <laughs> he established another tithes for them to take of their own people. But, wait. Oh, this Melchizedek guy? I found something strange. He was only mentioned twice in the whole Old Testament. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, and Psalms 110 and 4. But if you read above in Psalm 110, you find out, it says, Sit down at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's the first verse. 
Then it goes down and says, I've, I've swore, God said, I have swore and will not repent that I've made thee a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hmm. Well, what that got doing anything? I mean, you know. Well, see, God had a plan that we didn't see. He had a plan we didn't see. Watch this. So, now we see, if we look at the scripture, we see that it is taught in the New Testament. But let's go down and look at some other stuff. I want to bring out a couple of verses here that I think we might need to know. Let me show you something. In uh, Genesis, not Genesis, excuse me, in Hebrews 10 and 1. Hebrews 10 and 1. Here's what we're not understanding. We understand it when, by what we've been taught, but not understanding the big picture. Here's the big picture. Hebrews 10 and 1, it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. So now we can acknowledge that things that took place in the, the Old Testament under the law, the scriptures said that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So all the things in the law were the preliminary things to prepare us to come into Christ. Watch this. Even the tithes. Ooh, 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 ooh. Even the tithes. We didn't know that. Because they were not the very image. The complete image or the full image hadn't even came yet. Not even for the tithes. We didn't know that. So, let's look at some other stuff. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Let's go to Hebrews. The fifth chapter. Now I found out in my research that the name Melchizedek, and by the way, in the Old Testament is spelled differently. It's got you know got a Z in the place of an S, and they got a C in the you know uh, in the New Testament a C in the place of the K. So you need to look up the difference. It's two times in the Old Testament, and it's nine times in the New. But wait. In the New Testament, the name Melchizedek only appears in one book and only appears in three chapters. Hmm. Only appears in Hebrews. In the fifth chapter, the sixth chapter, there's one each. Fifth chapter, no, fifth chapter has two. Excuse me. The fifth chapter has two. And the sixth chapter has one, but the seventh chapter has six. So there's nine places in the New Testament in Hebrews alone. Okay, so now, if you go to Hebrews 5 and 6, here's what you'll find. Now, it's talking about Christ not glorifying himself in the fifth verse, to be high priest. And it's said in the sixth verse, as it is said also in what place? Another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We didn't realize the wording that it says you are that forever. Did you not know that could not be said of the priest that was on the earth because they died? So that particular person could not be there forever, but another high priest was brought in, or another priest was brought in because men die. But God declared that he would be one forever, which simulates that he's never going to die. Okay? I'm sitting leading up to something. Never going to die, this guy. <laughs> Excuse me, Lord, I don't mean to, don't jack me up or nothing. Let's go down to the... Um, mm, 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 mm. 10th verse, and it says, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hmm. So, he was not called after the Levitican order, but of the order of Melchizedek, which means king, priest of the most high God which existed four generations before the Levitican priesthood existed. Hmm. wonder why. Okay, let's just take a look here and let's see what we got. 
peek down here and see what we got. Okay. Now let's go down to the seventh chapter. No, yeah. Oh, no, let me go to six. Let me go to six. I think it's going to be six and twenty. Let's go to six and twenty. I believe I have that. Let's see. I think I want to go six and twenty. Yes. Six and twenty. Ooh, look at 6 and 19. Okay, now it says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth, entereth into that within the veil. It's going in, it's entering into that which, which is in the veil. Now watch what it says. Whither the forerunner, and that means a scout, is for us entered. You go like, who that? It goes, <laughs> even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, no one of the Levitican order was high enough to go in there. But only the king priests of Salem, his lineage could. Which Jesus became after that order. Do you see that? Wow. Okay. Next, let's go to the seventh chapter. In the seventh chapter, the first verse, it begins to tell us about who Melchizedek is. Now, it refers back to the 14th chapter of Genesis. And it's watch, it says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, Priest of the Most High God, that's what he calls them over there in Genesis. Who met Abraham, now they call him Abraham now because this is after God changed his name. Returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Which brings us into another situation. He gave a tenth part of all. Some people say, well, you know, you give tithes out of your, you know, your, 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 your net. And, you know, and he gave whatever his income, whatever his wholesomeness was, that's what he gave. And we'll show you another scripture for that. Watch this. <laughs> of all. First, being, by interpretation, the king of righteousness. And after that, also the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Watch this. And it says... Without Father, now this particular scripture, folks get twisted because they think, ah, oh, this is glorious, this is spiritual, because he didn't have a father or a mother. He must have dropped down from God. No, 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 no. That is not, not what that meant. <laughs> What's this? Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest. Continually. So, well, well, Doc, it just said, just like Jesus. Well, wait a minute. Okay, let's let's say let's say he was just like Jesus, because this is referring to him being like the Son of God. Uh, did you have a mother? Uh, yeah. So that can't be what we thought it was. Did he have a father? Uh, yeah. So that can't be the way we thought. He would to be like Jesus. He had to have a mother or and a father. But what that means is. The way the priests used to become, you had to be of the lineage of Levi, and that means pedigree. Like, you know, you got a full-blooded German shepherd from Germany and all that kind of good stuff, or Rockwaller that's got, you know, they got uh, uh, red in its fur, or you got one of those, I forget the other kind, that's all black, okay? So now, those are pedigrees. So the way they did it, the way you became a priest or and a high priest, you had to be of the lineage of Levi. So if there's no record of your mother and your father being in that order, you could not be. So there was no record of what that guy's name again? Yeah. Jesus, no record of Jesus, nor was there any record of Melchizedek in their paperwork, in their history. So it's showing you that they were just alike. Both of them were not accepted. All right? Watch this. But it says also, abides a priest forever. Oh, for continually. Watch this fourth, fourth verse of the seventh chapter. This is important. Now, 
He said, you want to consider how great Melchizedek really was? This man, <laughs> whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And the tenth of the spoils means everything he took, everything he gathered, he gave him a tenth of it. So, if you want to interpret that into today's society, whatever you make, tithes come off to them. What, what, what about after the government take that? Uh, uh, that's between you and the government. Don't take any chances because we can be cursed with a curse. Now let me get this up. I want to show you that there were dual tithes and we didn't know it. Watch. And barely they, watch this, and, and barely they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That is, their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. All the brethren came out of the loins of Abraham and they were told to take tithes of them. Okay? Watch what it says. But he whose descendant is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham. Whoa. He whose descendant is not counted. They weren't counting Melchizedek. He didn't count to them. But he received tithes of Abraham. We don't count him, but yeah, he was greater than Abraham. Abraham to give him tithes. So, watch this. He received tithes of him that had the promise. Now all the promises that God gave to Abraham was before four generations before the Vatican order came up. But Abraham being a great man that God has called him to be still gave tithes to Melchizedek. Watch. Let's reason. Watch this. Watch this that verse. And without all contradiction the less is blessed of the better. So Melchizedek was better than the Le Levitican order, better than Abraham, better than, all right? And watch this, here's the kicker, ugh! Watch what it says, eight verse. And here, the writer saying, here men that receive tithes, watch this, and here men that die, here, here men that die receive tithes under the Levitican order. Watch this. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. But he was not of the Levitican order. Jesus is not under the Levitican order, but under the order of Melchizedek, which is higher order than that of the Levites. And it says, he liveth that receiveth them. So, well, if Unless Jesus done died recently, he's still sitting there receiving the tithes. So why would a God have his son, the Savior of the world, sitting in the heavens to receive tithes if tithes is not taught for the New Testament? He ever lived to receive them. Where are they going to come from? You, look at that. Please look at that. <laughs> look at that eighth verse. It's clear as the, a bell, clear as day. And here men that died received tithes. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. But remember, Jesus is not under Levitican order. He's under Melchizedek, the king priest, the uh, high priest of the most high God, which tithes were given before the Levitican order. So the Levitican order was one, and the tithing to Melchizedek and his offspring is another. Ready for this? This is going to get strange. To show you that tithes today given to Jesus today exceeds the Levitican order. What if, what if, as Abraham was four generations before Levi and the Levites, what if the Levites, this is going to be strong, 
but it's pure scripture. What if the Levites in their generation had paid tithes to Melchizedek also? Somebody said, well, doctor, that's crazy because uh, that was like four generations later. How could they pay tithes to Melchizedek? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I know it's scriptural, though. How, how God managed that one, that's between God. But that's not the issue. The issue is people saying that tithes are not for today. So, well, then why did Levi give tithes? And Levi didn't even exist. How did he give tithes to Melchizedek? Watch this. Ninth verse. Ready? Hebrews 7 and 9. And as I may so say, the writer says, and I may so say, uh, Levi also. Huh? Levi also what? Who receiveth, receiveth tithes. Did what? He paid tithes in Abraham. Huh? He paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet, look at this, look at this, he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Oh my God. I don't know how God did that. I don't know how God, you know, I had this certain thing I don't even ask him about. But imagine the word God, word of God says clearly that Levi, he paid tithes to Melchizedek. Because he was in the loins of Abraham. When Abraham gave uh, uh, tithes to Melchizedek back then, four generations before then, Levi paid tithes in Abraham. Because he was in Abraham's loins. Meaning, whatever's in, whatever Abraham would pass on to Isaac and Jacob, and then the, the sons of Jacob would pass down to Levi. Whatever was in Abraham was passed down to them. But God's word said that they paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was so much greater. So now Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, clear as a bell. Oh my God. And he ever lived to receive tithes. How do you say you don't pay tithes? How do you come to the conclusion that Tithing is not New Testament, sir, ma'am, when you haven't searched it out. And I'm saying this for all of you that are out there giving tithes and you feel good about what you're doing before the Lord and this thing has sprung up and it comes up every so often, every 10, 15 years, someone comes up and say, you know what, tithes is not New Testament. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. And not only that, it's after a greater order because... The tithe that we knew, which was biblical, for the Old Testament, is swallowed up. And it's lesser than the tithes we're supposed to give today because we're giving it unto a higher order than the Levitican order. We're giving it unto the, the offspring of the king priests of Salem, the uh, uh, offspring of the priests of the Most High God. But he liveth forever. Not only that, not only that. If you go down, you'll find out also that the priests of the Levitical order, they were charged to do the job. Jesus, God swore with an oath. The other priest wasn't made priest with an oath. Jesus was. And the reason because they died. But this, you know, reason, watch this. Go down to the 15th verse. No, 14th. Watch, 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 watch. Because the, the, in the 13th verse and above that, it talks about things that they did. Now watch this 14th verse, 7 and 14. And it says this. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, watch this, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, Arise another priest. It was evident that it was needed. Who is made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of an endless life. Oh, Jesus. That's why he ever liveth. He has an endless life. His priesthood never changes. And he sits there 
receiving the tithes. The scripture says so. Here men that died received it, but he, he there, it is of him that receiveth the tithes that is said that he liveth. He lives forever. My point is we need to search out stuff. Now, I'm going to show you something else that's strong. Do you know that uh, along with the law, tithes were short of God's intent? We didn't know that. We didn't know that God had the law. When the, the scripture said the law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, what was his intent? Now watch this. It's going to get real strange. And it's right here. Watch. 19th verse. For the law made nothing perfect. Hmm. But the bringing in of a better hope did. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> the subject matter here is perfect. The law made nothing perfect, but the look, but the bringing in of a better hope did. So you mean Christ came? He not only brought in a better, more rewarding. Because the scripture says what we have is built on better promises, a more rewarding and acceptable tithes than that of the Levites, because our order that we're giving tithes to is higher than that. Oh my God. And his intent on the law is to bring us to a point and give us hope where the law could make nothing perfect. Now, the bringing in a better hope did. By which we draw nigh unto God. This 19, do you not know the, the law was not perfect, but grace and truth brought forth a complete and perfect way of giving tithe straight to God? Not only that, it was designed, this New Testament, which we're under grace, is designed to make things perfect, including me and you. Only we didn't know it. Because look what it said. Clear as a bell, 19th verse. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Look, watch this 21st verse. For those priests were made without an oath. Like I said earlier. Those priests, the Levitical order, they didn't, they didn't have no oath. There was no oath from God. He just said, take these guys of the tribe of Levites, make them priests. Right? But this, what the but? But this, <laughs> with an oath by him that said unto him, Lord, the Lord swear and will not repent. That's going back unto, you know, uh, Psalms 1, 10, and 4. And will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after all the Melchizedek. God swore. I'm bringing in something better than what they did. And it's Jesus after the order of Melchizedek. And I swear by myself, it's better than. Our order of tithes today is higher than the order of tithes of the Levites. Only we didn't know it. Watch this. God said, I'm not going to repent. By who, watch this. By so much more was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Oh, he brought in this new testament, the better testament, with the better tithes and with the ability to be made perfect. Because the law didn't make anything perfect, but Jesus, our hope, did. Ooh. Ooh. Watch this. <laughs> 23. And they truly were many priests. There's a lot of them. It tells you why. Because they were not suffered to continue. You know why? Because of the reason of death. They died. So that they had to make another one. <laughs> What's this? But this man, oh God, because he continueth ever, oh Jesus, he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Jesus is it. Higher order than the Levitican order and a continued priesthood that changes not because he liveth forever and stands there or sits there on the right hand of God to receive the tithes. 
the scripture says, there he receiveth them. Uh, so if he's there and he receiveth them, and this was written in the New Testament, and he's there receiving them, how do you say tithes are not for the day? And you come up with this bright idea that tithes are not for the New Testament. And it's not in the book. I'm sorry, somebody didn't read. Somebody didn't study. Somebody needs to be corrected because you're misguiding folks. And anyone that stands in that is misguiding and shame on you. Because you, you, you take people that aren't learned and aren't skilled and aren't experienced in the things of God. You'll take for them the only link they have of a blessing. Many folks that are older and haven't learned of God, now they're learning in this last generation, and you take it from them by saying, tithes is not for the day. You didn't do your research, partner. This is why I'm strong in this, because people that will hear this will, will know, and I believe that God will cause this to, to scatter abroad so people will know. It is biblical. It is solid, and it is better than the Old Testament tithing in the first place. Just somebody didn't know it was in here. My advice to anyone that's going to teach on the subject matter, you probably heard me say it before, it's important that you do your research on the total issue. Don't just go by what you've heard. Don't take what people say, you know, uh, uh, and just swallow it. Take it for face, you know, value. Do your research on it before you swallow it. You even smell food. You're going to eat, go to a special place or a different place to eat, and you're going to smell the food first. You know, I never ate here before. <laughs> you're going to look at it. Uh -huh. right, you, you go, and don't smell right, you go, uh -huh. but don't that look good? Somebody can submit to you. Don't that look good? Yeah, it look good, but it don't smell right. I don't, I don't know. Well, you're just not used to the smell. You dog don't skip your mind. It ain't going in my face. You should be this way about your soul. We all should. I've taught my people, those that have been with me 15 years, some even longer. I've taught them as their pastor to examine everything, especially made. 